1 Samuel 20. Yeah, it was nice to that Jessica was able to go and kind of represent the church, even though she's not a member of this church anymore, but you know what I mean. Absolutely. Um, so that, that was nice that she got to go, and I'm sure that was a nice blessing to Cheryl to see her there. You know, it's it's kind of it's interesting because, like me, not having grown up in a saved family, I don't have a lot of people like ahead of me. So it's kind of nice knowing there's someone there, you know, waiting for me to show up. You know, I'm sure I'm not number one on his mind. I guarantee you that. <laughs> I'm way down the list. I'm sure, but still, you know, he would be happy to see me. I'm sure. So that's kind of nice, you know. And you have Fritz and. Um, he's uh, he's up there. Remember Fritz mm -hmm. and Allison mm -hmm. and uh, from our church and Donald. Yeah. You know, so the more there, the kind of like the more you look forward to it. Amen, and I know some of you have many many more than that. So I don't have really a whole lot of people that I know are waiting for me. You know what I'm saying? So having another one that I that I know knows me is kind of nice. Maybe you can show me around. And it's kind of interesting, like, if there is chalk up there, I mean, just, just think if, like, he gets to draw some pictures for Moses, because they don't know what it is, you know what I'm saying? Moses and David, and they're kind of hanging out, and Fester's showing them what chalk art is, and then the ultraviolet light comes on, and whoa, you know. I don't know, I, I'm simplifying it, I'm sure, but, like I said, my mind kind of works in weird ways like that. I'm always... <laughs> Probably, you know, you know, I understand, you know, but with my limited experience in this world, I apply what I understand here to there because I have no idea. pretty dead on with it. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised. Same here. All right, so First Samuel chapter 20, we'll read, uh, let's see here, it's a long chapter, so we'll read the first 10 verses and we'll jump into it. So let's read 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse number 1 through 10. We already covered the first few verses here at the end of class last week, and then we'll continue. So verse number 1 of 1 Samuel chapter 20, And David fled from Naoth in Ramah and came and said before Jonathan, What have I done? What is mine iniquity? What is my sin before thy father that he seeketh my life? And he said unto him, God forbid, thou shalt not die. Behold, my father will do nothing, either great or small, but that he will show it me. And why should my father hide this thing from me? It is not so. And David sware him over and said, Thy father certainly knoweth that I have found grace in thine eyes. And he saith, Let not Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly, as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, there is but a step between me and death. Then said Jonathan unto David, Whatsoever thy soul desireth, I will even do it for thee. And David said unto Jonathan, Behold, tomorrow is the new moon, and I should not fail to sit with the king at meat. But let me go, and I, that I may hide thy, myself in the field unto the third day at even. If thy father at all miss me, then say, David earnestly ask leave of me, that he might run to Bethlehem, his city. For there is a yearly sacrifice there for all the family. If he say thus, It is well, thy servant shall have peace. But if he be very wroth, then be sure that evil is determined by him. Therefore thou shalt deal kindly with thy servant, for thou hast brought thy servant into a covenant of the Lord with thee. Notwithstanding, if there be in me iniquity, slay me thyself, for why shouldest thou bring me to thy father? And Jonathan said, Be Far be it from thee, for if I knew certainly that evil were determined by my father to come upon thee, then would I not tell it thee? Then said David to Jonathan, Who shall tell me? Or what if thy father answer thee roughly? Let's pray. Lord, we're thankful for this account of Jonathan and David's relationship and how Jonathan looks out for David and David needed some help and his friend came through for him. So help us to learn some things from this passage here. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So as we, we uh, kind of finished off last week talking about how David had the right heart attitude when he went to Jonathan. He ran to Jonathan and says, you know, what have I done? That's, that's a good, good thing to do. We should all look at that. What have I done? If someone's upset with you, first thing you should do is look at yourself. What have I done? You know, we're always so defensive. What have I done? That should be the first instinct. Have I done something to offend this person? Have I done something wrong to this person? Because usually you're doing things to people ignorantly and there's miscommunication and you might not have done anything, but they think you did. 
So David has the right attitude here. What have I done? Uh, what is mine iniquity? What is my sin before thy father that he seeketh my life? So he's asking Jonathan, has, have you heard anything? Has he accused me of anything? What, what is it that I've done? Um, and he said unto him, God forbid thou shalt not die. Behold, my father will do nothing either great or small, but that he will show it me. And why should my father hide this thing from me? It is not so. And like I said last week, so Jonathan's like, my dad tells me everything. I would know if he was trying to hurt you. Well, he didn't know. So he's, he's telling David, he's like, you know, why would my father hide something like that from me? And David responds. He gives him the answer. And David swore him over and said, Thy father certainly knoweth that I have found grace in thine eyes. And he saith, Let not Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. So David responds, Well, the reason why he wouldn't tell you is because he knows we're tight. We're buddies. He's not going to let you know his evil intentions because he knows you'll tell me. So he didn't. he's not telling you. Which is a reasonable response. And obviously Jonathan understands that after he replies this way. The rest of that verse says, But truly as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, there is but a step between me and death. So David says, Look, there's only a step between me and death. I'm telling you, your dad's trying to kill me. I, I, certainly, there's a step between me and death. That's that's all there is now. I'm, I'm that close to being killed. you got to understand the gravity of the situation, Dave, or, uh, David's telling Jonathan. So verse number four. Then said Jonathan unto David, Whatsoever thy soul desireth, I will even do it for thee. So he responds to John's question. He lets him know why his dad wouldn't respond to him. It totally makes sense. So then Jonathan says, okay, that makes sense. You know, what do you want me to do? You know, what, well, how can I help you? You know, you, come, you came here. Now, how can I help you? Now, remember, Saul is in a trance over there in Naoth, in Ramah, with Samuel. And so David found an opportunity to run back here to Jonathan and seek some help. Verse number uh, 5, And David said unto Jonathan, Behold, tomorrow is the new moon, and I should not fail to sit with the king at meat. But let me go, that I may hide myself in the field under the third day at even. And so, uh, without me actually taking the time to take you there, but the, the Hebrews' calendar is a lunar can calendar. You probably all know that already, but they don't go by the sun. They go by the moon, right? So the new moon is a new month. And if you go back to Numbers chapter 10 and verse number 10 and chapter 28, verse number 11 you'll see this idea of the people having a feast to recognize the new moon, right? So this was sort of part of their, every monthly they'd have like a little feast. So David is expected at the king's table for this feast, right? So David's like, look, he's going to wonder where I'm at. I can't show up. He wants to kill me. I can't, I can't show up. So we, we've got to make some sort of excuse for why I'm not there. And so David's starting to hatch his plan to give Jonathan the ability to tell what his dad's intentions really are. Because he's got to convince Jonathan. You know, he, he's already replied to Jonathan, but he has to convince Jonathan what his dad is up to. And to prove it to Jonathan, this is his plan for Jonathan to find out what his dad's true intentions are because his dad won't tell him. Right? Are you following me? Am I making sense? His dad will not tell him because he doesn't want David to find out, although David already knows. He's already fled from him. Um, but Jonathan doesn't know, and he needs Jonathan to know because David is on the run. And so it's the new moon, David says, verse number five, and David said unto Jonathan, Behold, tomorrow is the new moon, and I should not fail to sit with the king at meat, but let me go that I may hide myself in the field under the third day at even. So here's his plan. So he's, David's going to run and hide. In verse number six, he says, If thy father at all miss me, then say, David earnestly ask leave of me that he might run to Bethlehem, his city. For there is a yearly sacrifice there for all the families. Well, this isn't true either. You know, it's another lie. Um, David's hiding in a field. He, didn't, he wasn't called home to, to a feast. But this would be an excuse that Saul would buy because people are celebrating the new moon. And so David's family, apparently, in this lie, has a yearly feast for the new moon. It's sort of like their family Thanksgiving or something. And so that's going to be his excuse for not being there, that my brother asked me to come home and celebrate with my family. So Jonathan is being asked to tell his dad that he, Jonathan, gave David permission to go home uh, and be with his family. This is what he's setting up uh, to prove to Jonathan that Saul's intentions for him are, are evil. So, again, verse number 6, If thy father at all miss me, then say, David earnestly ask leave of me that he might run to Bethlehem, his city, for there is a yearly sacrifice there for all the family. 
Again, Bethlehem is called the city of David and all that other kind of stuff. We know that. Um, and so David's hatching this plan here. In verse number 7, so he's basically telling Jonathan, tell him this, this is why I'm not there, and then wait for his response. And depending on his response, that's going to let you know where he's at. How he responds to me not being there is going to let you know that what I'm telling you is true or not. So in verse number 7, if he say thus, it is well, thy servant shall have peace. But if he be very wroth, which is angry, then be sure that evil is determined by him. Therefore thou shalt deal kindly with thy servant. He's talking about himself. Telling Jonathan, therefore thou shalt deal kindly with thy servant. For thou hast brought thy servant into a covenant of the Lord with thee. Notwithstanding, if there be in me iniquity, slay me thyself. For why shouldest thou bring me to thy father? So basically, he tells Jonathan, so go there. He's going to notice I'm not there. And how he responds to why I'm not there is going to let you know. If he says, oh, it's no big deal, then okay, he's calmed down. If, he's, if he gets really upset, because why would he be upset that David's not there? Because he's wanting to kill him, right? And he's not there. So he would be angry if his intentions are to kill me. So however Saul responds, that's going to be a way for Jonathan to tell what his father's intentions are, and then he can let David know. He can relay that information to David, uh, so David knows how to be how to behave or how to respond from that point forward. So verse number uh, eight. So he says, and again, if you think I've done something wrong, then just kill me right now. You know, just get it over with. Just kill me. I'd rather you kill me than to be put into the hands of your your father. You know, you might actually have mercy on me. You know, just kill me quick. Your dad might not. So how about you kill me? If I've done something wrong and you're convinced I'm the bad guy, then just kill me. And of course, Jonathan's response. He, Jonathan knows he hasn't done anything wrong. So verse number nine, Jonathan, Jonathan said, Far be it from thee. You know, like, no way, man. I'm not doing that. I know you haven't done anything wrong. For if I knew certainly that evil were determined by my father to come upon thee, then would not I tell thee? So Jonathan again is saying, see, I'm still not sure. I, I'm not sure. I know you're sure, right? but I'm not sure what my dad... I, I can tell you're convinced that this is my dad's intent, but I'm not convinced that this is my dad's intent because I don't know my dad that way. Well, he's about to find out. Then said David to Jonathan, Who shall tell me? Or what if thy father answers the, answer thee roughly? So then David's like, Okay, so after you find out, after our little plan here, after you find out what my dad's intentions are, how, how are you going to get the message to me? How is that going to work? Because it's likely that you know, Saul is going to keep an eye on Jonathan to, to see, you know, watch where Jonathan goes because he knows he's tight with David. So a good way of finding... I mean, you see that all the time. If you watch any of the cop shows, detective shows... That you know, someone's on the run. They go. They look for their their last best friend's house or their mom's house or their dad's house. They go there and they stake them out and see if they show up there, right. right? So, so you know that's been going on forever. When people are in trouble, they turn to others that they know. And so, if you want to find somebody, you go f talk to people that know them. So. He asks Jonathan, you know, how are you going to let me know this? You know how well, how your father responded. <clears throat> Verse 11, And Jonathan said unto David, Come, and let us go out into the field. And they went out, both of them, into the field. So they're, Jonathan's now being you know, cautious. Let's, let's make sure there's no listening ears. Let's, let's step aside here. Let's go out into the field and talk about this. And he's worried about cell phone cameras and all that other kind of stuff. So let's go out into the field here. And they went out, both of them, into the field. And Jonathan said unto David, O Lord God of Israel. So he's sort of like appealing to the Lord here. He's kind of praying out loud with David there. And Jonathan said unto David, O Lord God of Israel, when I have sounded my father about tomorrow any time or the third day, and behold, if there be good toward David, and I then send not unto thee and show it thee, the Lord do so and much more to Jonathan. He's speaking in the first person there which is interesting third person whatever whichever one it is <laughs> and, but if it please my father to, it's kind of weird when people do that though they say their own name I, yeah it's just kind of weird to me 
But if it please my father to do thee evil, then I will show it thee and send thee away, that thou mayest go in peace, and the Lord be with thee, as he hath been with my father. So Jonathan says, okay, he's like, I'm going to reassure David here, and I'm going to make another covenant. We're going to, like, I'm going to make the Lord as my witness. This is what we're going to do, okay? So he's not just saying he got his fingers crossed behind his back or anything like that. He's, he's bringing the Lord, he's invoking the Lord into this, this covenant here. And then he uses an interesting word there, so if you don't know what it means, I'll explain it to you. So Jonathan said unto David, O Lord God of Israel, when I have sounded my father about tomorrow, and the word sounded means like to examine, to investigate. In shipping terms, in like nautical terms, like when, when, when captains would sound, for their ship, they're looking how deep the water is. When they're getting close to shore, you know, they would they would they would investigate the depth, right? And, and so they're sounding, um, and they would determine how deep the water is with like a rope with a with a rock on the bottom of it or a weight of, of some kind, and they would let it down, and then they could s say how deep it how deep the water is. Also, like you kind of you know. Uh, like uh, Puget Sound over there in Washington. I think that's Washington or Oregon. I believe it's Washington. You know, you, you see these bays are sometimes called a sound. Right. Right? That's because ships were always sounding, right? So this is a sound. We're in the sound. It's time to sound. It's time to find out how deep it is. It's getting shallow, right? So then areas would start be, being called that. So it's a term we don't really use much anymore. So. Jonathan says, when I have sounded my father, when I've examined him and watched his reaction to you not being there, is what he's saying. I'm gonna, my, my dad's being put, what's that? Yeah, testing the water, good, that's good. That's how that phrase is, is used. He's testing the waters, not just to see how cold it is. He's testing to see how deep it is, right? We're going to test this thing out. Very good, I like that. And so he, he says, like, when I've examined my father about tomorrow, any time, or the third day, and behold, if there be good toward David, and I then send not unto thee, and show it thee, the Lord do so, and much more to Jonathan. But if it please my father to do thee evil, then I will show it thee, and send thee away, that thou mayest go in peace, and the Lord be with thee, as he hath been with my father. And thou shalt not only, while yet I live, show me the kindness of the Lord, that I die not, but also thou shalt not cut off thy kindness from my house forever. No, not when the Lord hath cut off the enemies of David, every one from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, Let the Lord even require it at the hand of David's enemies. And Jonathan caused David to swear again, because he loved him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. Then Jonathan said to David, Tomorrow is the new moon, and thou shalt be missed because thy seat will be empty. And when thou hast stayed three days, then thou shalt go down quickly and come to the place where thou didst hide thyself a chapter ago, chapter 19, verse 2 and 3, when he ran away. Didst hide thyself when the business was in hand and shalt remain by the stone Ezel. So Jonathan's making a covenant with David. This is what I'm going to do based on my father's response. You're going to go hide where you hid last time, so I kind of know where you're at. And this is what I'm going to do. Okay, so I think that's pretty simple to understand there. So they're hatching this plan, uh, but I like what Jonathan does here. You can kind of tell that Jonathan sees the writing on the wall. He's, he's, he, David has been blessed, and David's enemies have always been stopped. The Lord has always been with David. And if my dad is an enemy of, of David, my dad's going to be brought to an end. And I'm going to be lumped in with that because I'm his son. So I'm going to appeal to David to remember my family. So he's protecting him. He knows that God is with David. He, he sees what's happening. He knows what's happening. And so to protect his family, he's appealing to David. Remember my family. Don't forget. Cause he, he, so he's sort of letting it out that he kind of knows what's going on, but he still has to have it proven to him. Okay. by his dad's actions but you can tell in his heart he knows what's happening right. it's he's finally dawning on him and he's already taking action to protect himself from what he sees coming All right does that make sense i hope that makes sense but that's that's what's going on here he's he sees what's going on he knows his dad's kingdom if this is true if saul is really intending evil to david 
everyone that's been against David, including Goliath, God has been against that person and has been and protected David all this time. And the people love him and David has done nothing wrong. And so if this is true, that my father really does intend this, then his downfall is sure. And I don't want to get lumped in with that. Because he shouldn't have to suffer because of what his dad's doing, right? That's not right. So, verse 19. So then he's kind of going to explain to him how he's going to kind of reveal this to him. Because it'll be very hard. Again, he, Jonathan understands that his dad's going to have people watching his every move. So he can't just go to David and, uh, and, and tell him directly. Although they do end up meeting here anyway. So it's like taking a risk. But he hatches this plan on how he's going to give David the hint on how his dad responded. He says, go and hide. Go to hide that same place that you hid before. Verse number 20, and I will shoot three arrows on the side thereof as though I shot at a mark. So I'm going to pretend like I'm doing like target practice and I'm going to shoot. And behold, I will send a lad. So he'll have like some servant go fetch the arrows. I will send a lad saying, go, find out the arrows. If I expressly say unto the lad, Behold, the arrows are on this side of thee. In other words, on, on my side of, of him. Close. If, my, if I say they're on this side of where the lad is. If I say they're, nope, they're back toward me. This side. The arrows are on this side of you. Take them. Then come now, for there is peace to thee and no hurt as the Lord liveth. So that's going to be this, the sign that everything's cool. My dad's cool. Everything's good. If I say the arrows are on this side of the lad who's fetching my arrows. But if I say thus unto the young man, Behold, the arrows are beyond thee. Go thy way, for the Lord hath sent thee away. See, he's going to be able to yell that because the arrows are at a distance. So he's going to be able to yell, Hey, they're way beyond you. Go thy way. Be at peace. It's, that's going to be him. But if anyone is spying on him, he says, I'm talking to the guy looking for my arrows. But he's actually talking to David who's hiding in the trees or in the field. So do you follow that? I, th I think it's pretty obvious. So it's a pretty good plan. For the, the end of verse 22, For the Lord hath sent have sent thee away. Not me sending you away. The Lord has sent you away. Because the Lord's... Remember, they made a covenant with the Lord involved too. Verse number 23. Actually, I kind of want to back up a little bit. Where Jonathan says he, he loved David as his own soul. I didn't want to stop there because the whole plan is a bunch of verses lumped in together. So we had to read that whole passage. But we don't really know this kind of brotherly love. Right. I, I can say it by my experience. I don't. We just don't. Um, th throughout all of history, like we've said over and over and over again, life was just nothing but suffering continually, and then you die. I mean, you're searching for food. It was very rare for anyone to have a life of any luxury at all. Mm -hmm. It's just you're looking for your next meal, and then you die. I mean, and then your aches and pains and everything else. There's no medicines. There's no surgeries. There's no none of that. You break a leg. You could be hobbled the rest of your life just because of a broken leg. You know, so life was pretty miserable. People weren't living past 50, if they even made it that far. So, in that world, if you had a friend, your life would depend on that person. I mean, literally depend on that person helping you. Helping you find food or feeding you, and then when they need something, then you help them. Literally, your existence is depending upon those around you. That you would think that that would cause some sort of bond that we don't know because my life isn't dependent on yours and yours isn't dependent on mine. That's just the facts. Again, you know, our society is so horrible. Get out of here. I don't know how many ways and times and examples I can explain this. <laughs> but you live in a land of luxury that people have never known. You can say that's all you know because, I mean, your phone, you got your phone and you look at well, everybody around the world's got their social media and their phones. Everybody seems to be doing good, but it hasn't been that way forever. This is relatively brand new. This has been nothing but a, a split second in the time of history. You're living in a time of unknown luxury. The fact that you can just, we could even just meet here and not be afraid of going to jail or being executed is a miracle in and of itself. Right. I mean, even our faith has been easy because when you become a Christian you're just part of the popular club well it's not so popular anymore right, 
Well, pretty soon being part of the club might not be a good idea unless you've got good faith. Then that's what's coming. How many countries you can? Yeah, right now. <laughs> Try being a Christian in Egypt. Agents at the Try being a Christian in, in I don't know, some of the countries you can't be. You're just dead. Um, you have to hide or you're just a dead man. Some of the, some of the um, Muslim nations you can be, but you don't have the same rights. You're a second class citizen. So you've got no hope of a decent life. They'll let you live. They tolerate you, but that's it. Um, the Far East, like in China, I'm not quite sure. I know they're persecuted. I know they're thrown in jail. Um, but they're allowed, but under strict control. Um, and most of that's kind of like, as long as you're not proselytizing and all that other kind of stuff. Right now in China, Muslims are put in, in concentration camps. It's a fact, million. There's a million Uyghur Muslims that are, that are in labor camps right now in China. But yet we're, we're like, you know, we're like, yeah, let, those are great ideas. Let's embrace those and vote for people that support the same ideas that China has. Yay, this is a great idea, said nobody with any common sense except Amen. the 70, 80 million people that just voted for the Democrats. Good grief. People are so stupid. It drives me nuts. They have no idea what the ideas that they're playing with. <laughs> but anyway, I don't want to get too far afield. So this, this brotherly love that Jonathan and David had, and then you could even apply that to like Paul, Paul and his travel companions, Timothy, Silas, Luke, name the whole bunch. I mean, when you're traveling, look at the areas that he's traveled. You've seen the maps, so you should have the maps kind of in your mind's eye, at least a general idea of the area. These guys are traveling. There's no cops. There's robbers on the road. There's you know, whatever. And they're traveling together. And they're walking miles, and they're they're jumping on ships with a bunch of dudes they don't even know. But they're 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 going to the place they're going, so they could get thrown overboard. They have no idea. They gotta trust people they don't know, but they have one another, right? So that there's a bond there. You know, Paul gets a fever, gets sick, so Timothy has to catch some squirrels and and use a wet cloth to cool them down. And I mean, they have to literally take care of one another. That's all they have. Right? That's we don't experience that. Yeah. We don't that we don't have we don't live like that, you know what I'm saying? I've never had to wipe your brow when you're sweating with a fever and you've never had to do that for me. Because yeah. I got charity and you got joy, so we're good. But anyway, so you can see how men could have men could have a relationship to where, dude, I'm all undone if you don't come through. I have to trust you and I do with my life. And then they're in battles together, and they're being robbed, and yet they run off the robbers together. And um, he could have turned his back on me at that time, and I would have been toast, but he didn't. And so this is what they're talking about here. So when we see these kind of interactions between men in the Bible, or it says things like this, it's not weird in, re in, the, in the world history. It's weird to you and I, because we don't have, we haven't, lived in that world again so you do a good job of putting yourself in that world thinking about those things what it was like to live back then again they, like I said there's no 911 there's no cops you're literally on your own no hospitals none of that so you know Jonathan loved David as his own soul verse number 17 I'll make sure that I I pointed that out so verse number 23, and as touching the matter which thou and I have spoken of, behold, the Lord be between thee and me forever. And this is going to come back, um, this is going to come back later on in 2 Samuel when we read about Mephibosheth. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. David's going to remember the oath he made with Jonathan, and he's, he's going to fulfill that and show grace and mercy upon Mephibosheth because of this, because Jonathan's wisdom right here of saying, we're going to make a covenant here, not just between me and you, but my house and your house, mm -hmm. right? right? With the Lord as our, as our witness. And Jonathan did the right thing because they don't really get to, to hang out with each other ever again. Right. This is it. You're going to see that here in a second. So David hid himself in the field, and when the new moon was come, the king sat down to eat meat. And the king sat upon a seat, as at other times, even upon a seat by the wall. And Jonathan arose, and Abner sat by Saul's side. And David's place was empty. Nevertheless, Saul spake not anything that day, 
for he thought something had befallen him. He is not clean. Surely he is not clean. Again, they would have these feasts at the new moons. And if you, if, you know, I don't think I need to take you back to Levit Leviticus and all that other kind of stuff to explain what clean and unclean is. If you need to know what that is, that just means you're ceremonially, ceremonially unclean. Remember Samson, you know, he was unclean. Took a Nazarite vow, all that other kind of stuff. If you touch a dead body or whatever... You're, on, you're, you're unclean. You can't go to the feasts. You can't go to the ceremonies. You have to be cleansed. You can't do that. So this is what Saul is thinking. It's unusual for David not to be here. And David's one of them, you know, goody two-shoes dudes, you know, who goes to church a lot. So maybe he's unclean. Maybe he's done something. So he thinks evil of David immediately. Well, that's got to be the reason why he's not here. It's not a good reason. It's a bad one. Ah, he must be unclean. He must have failed somewhere. Because he's got evil thoughts about David for no reason other than the evil spirit that's, that's upon him. And then verse number 20, uh, I'm sorry, uh, verse number 27. And it came to pass on the morrow, which was the second day of the month, that David's place was empty. And Saul said unto Jonathan, his son, see, he knew how tight they were. So Jonathan has to know what's going on, right? Wherefore cometh not the son of Jesse to meet, neither yesterday nor today? And Jonathan answered Saul, David earnestly asked leave of me to go to Bethlehem. So he's telling the story that David told him to tell. Again, this isn't true. It's another lie. We talked about that last week, right? It was last week about lying. When people have evil intentions unto you, lying's not bad. It's actually a good plan. Because it's not, a, you're not, it's not like you're stopping justice. You're stopping someone from killing an innocent person. If you ever have the opportunity to save an innocent person, save them. Yes, yes. <laughs> that's your duty. Yes. You don't, you you don't uh, uh, throw them under a bus because your conscience says, "Well, the Bible says I'm not supposed to lie." Well, there's tons of examples in here where lying was a good idea, <laughs> and God blessed it. Amen. And it's kind of weird to hear a preacher say that, but like I said last week, there's wisdom involved in this stuff. Amen, right. The whole idea of not lying is to is is to not use an untruth to um, get out of consequences of your own actions or to prevent justice from happening. Like when you get caught, you broke something at home or you did something wrong against your parents' rules or whatever, and you lie to get out of trouble. That's wrong every single time. But if someone knocks on your door and wants to kill your mom and you're like, well, I can't lie, she's right there. <laughs> well, what's wrong with you, man? Right. Huh? She's not home. That's what you're supposed to say. Those days could be coming, so I'm trying to help you overcome that hurdle there if it gets in your way. So, the, the, you know, Saul's intentions are evil, so these guys are playing it wise as a serpent right now because they're treading lightly. So, nevertheless, uh, or I'm sorry, verse number uh, 29, And he said, Let me go, I pray thee, for our family hath a sacrifice in the city, and my brother, he hath commanded me to be there. And now, if I have found favor in thine eyes, let me get away, I pray thee, and see my brethren. Therefore he cometh not unto the king's table. So he tells them the story that they had hatched, okay? And so Jonathan takes ownership of this plan by, because the plan was that he was going to say he let David go. Jonathan let David, da Jonathan's authority let David go home. So he's throwing himself under the bus here. And verse number 30, Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan, and he said unto him, Thou son of a perverse, rebellious woman, <laughs> which is today the modern equivalent be you SOB, do not I know that thou hast chosen the son of Jesse to thine own confusion and unto the confusion of thy mother's nakedness? So, Saul gets mad at Jonathan. Now Jonathan's finally seeing what's going on. Now it's, it's finally being revealed to Jonathan that everything that David is saying is true, even though Jonathan kind of already knew it, but he needed the proof. Well, here's the proof. And Saul gets upset with Jonathan because Jonathan said he let David go. And as, as far as we know, his dad's never responded to him in this way before. Um, and so it's revealing his heart. And Jonathan, I would imagine his heart is broken, but... Um, and then he throws his his mother under the bus. You know, back then they would have more than one wife, so you know his mother might be different than his brother's mother. And you know, that's just, I don't you know I don't even want to have to try to explain all that stuff. But uh, he basically calls him an sob. And then verse thirty one, he says, "For as long as so now he's going to try to get Jonathan angry at David." 
So John, he's mad at Jonathan because Jonathan shows an allegiance to David over himself, over over him as his dad. So he's like, he's mad at that. Like, how can your allegiance be with him? So now he's getting ready to try to bring Jonathan against David. And how does he do that? He's basically going to tell him, don't you understand that David's going to take the kingdom and you're going to lose your spot because when I'm gone, you're the next king. You're the next in line. This is what he's going to try to use to get D Jonathan to turn his back on David. Verse 31, For as long as the son of Jesse liveth upon the ground, thou shalt not be established nor thy kingdom. Wherefore now send and fetch him unto me, for he shall surely die. So he makes it look like he gives himself a, like a, a noble reason for killing David because I'm trying to protect your rights to the throne, son. And a lot of people are... are uh, Easily uh, persuaded with stuff like that for all, their own selfish reasons. Like that's why it's always good to examine yourself because it's easy to know you're getting ready to do something wrong, but you're just looking for an excuse to justify it so it doesn't bother you. Right, right, right. And so Saul's trying to give Jonathan that excuse to allow him to turn his back on David because. Yeah, well, you and David are tight, but do you realize he's really trying to take what's yours? Mm -hmm. So, you have a reason to be upset with David. David's sneaking around trying to take your throne. Right. He's <laughs> against you. David's really against you, and he's trying to take what's rightfully yours. And it's not. And plus, Jonathan don't care about any of that stuff. Right. <laughs> he doesn't care to be king. You know, he just wants to be a friend and a good person, which is satisfactory enough, it should be. Um, and so his dad's trying to get him all uh, against David. And verse 32, And Jonathan answered Saul his father and said unto him, Wherefore shall he be slain? What hath he, what hath he done? And so this is a good response. What has he really done? Tell me, what has he done? And look at how his dad responds. Mm -hmm. And Saul cast a javelin at him to smite him. Wait a minute, what? Right. Get the point? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whereby Jonathan knew that it was determined of his father to slay David. So he really is serious. Because he's willing to kill me to kill David. So you know his heart's broken, but his response is not necessarily any weeping because not only is this wrong it it like is an insult to his sense of justice my friend has done nothing wrong so his response is fierce anger look at verse number 34 so Jonathan arose from the table in not just angry in fierce anger that's it that's it you've crossed the line that's wrong You've done wrong. And didn't and so he left the table. He didn't even eat. He wouldn't even eat. And did eat no meat the second day of the month. And that doesn't mean he was a vegetarian. <laughs> that just means he didn't eat food. Meat is basically just the word for food. Um, if you wanted to do an interesting study on the word meat, you can find wheat called meat in the Bible. It just means food. For he was grieved for David because his father had done him shame. So he allied himself with the person that has done right instead of allying himself in, with selfish reasons with the person who's doing wrong. And that's not always easy to do, especially in this dynamic, your father and your best friend. But Jonathan did the right thing. He sided with the person who's right, not with the person who's wrong. And that's when you get tested, especially youth, with peer pressure. Who are you going to side with? The guys are going to drag you down into the dumps? Or are you going to side with people that have your best interest in heart, that have done nothing wrong? Right? Are you going to side with those people that have evil intent? How many times have you seen, again, those cop shows, that you get a kid who's driving a car with his friends around, they're just hanging out, but these friends are no good, I can talk about this from first-hand experience, too. Not exactly this example. But these, these friends get out and they rob somebody's house, shoot somebody, run back out to the car. You're driving. You're going to prison. 
you're going to prison. You didn't know that's what they were going to do, but you're going to prison because you brought them there and took them away. I've seen, how many of those cop shows have you seen where someone now is going to prison for life, they did nothing, but they're just driving a car, yep. hanging out with the wrong people at the wrong place at the wrong time, and their parents and their other friends were telling them over and over, you need to get away from those people, you need to not have anything to do with those people, you shouldn't be talking with those people, you need to stay away because they're going to get you in trouble, they're going to ruin your life, and now they're in prison for life. And what good is it then to say, yeah, you were right, it's too late, you're in prison forever. Corrupt good manners. That's right, sister. That's exactly right. So Jonathan's like, I can't align myself with my own dad. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to follow the person who's doing right. Sometimes the older people kind of know and they can see things that you can't see. And they're not being jerks when they tell you you shouldn't be with that person. Mm -hmm. They see something you don't see. Right. They see something you can't see. They see something they saw when they were younger. Right. And learned already. And if you were smart, you'd pay attention before you ruin yourself. So Jonathan doesn't ruin himself because he would have become an enemy of David. And you know how that's going to end. <laughs> you know how that's going to end. It still ends up costing Jonathan because he doesn't leave home. He stays with his dad, but he doesn't side against David. So. Jonathan finds out really what his dad wants to do, and he, he knows it firsthand now. And so verse 34, So Jonathan arose from the table in fierce anger and did eat no meat the second day of the month, for he was grieved for David because his father had done him shame. And it came to pass in the morning that Jonathan went out into the field at the time appointed with David and a little lad with him, and he said unto his lad, Run, find out now the arrows which I shoot. And as the lad ran, he shot an arrow beyond him. And when the lad was come to the place of the arrow which Jonathan had shot, Jonathan cried after the lad and said, Is not the arrow beyond thee? And Jonathan cried after the lad, Make speed, haste, stay not. And Jonathan's lad gathered up the arrows and came to his master. So Jonathan was actually talking to David there, pretending he was talking to the kid getting his arrows. Verse 39, But the lad knew not anything, only Jonathan and David knew the matter. And Jonathan gave his artillery unto his lad and said unto him, Go, carry them to the city. And as soon as the lad was gone, David arose out of the place toward the south and fell on his face to the ground and bowed himself three times. And they kissed one another and wept one, one with another until David exceeded. Um, and Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, for as much as we have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord be between me and thee and between my seed and thy seed forever. And David honors that later on with Mephibosheth. We'll find that out in Second Samuel. And he arose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. This is it. They're done. They, they have no more relationship. They're done. David has to go on the run from Jonathan's father. Um, and when it says that uh, David and Jonathan kissed, it's not some perverted thing. Like people will tell you, if you go anywhere outside, not anywhere outside the United States, but a lot of places on this planet, that's how people greet one another. On the cheek, both sides. You, see, you still see that once in a while. They don't, we shake hands. They'll do the side, you know, they, they, their lips don't even actually touch the cheek, but they may make, the, make the, the motion. I don't know exactly how it was here, but uh, you'd have to read into this that it was some sort of romantic kiss. So don't fall for that stuff. People try to make that kind of application there, because how are they doing that? They're applying what they're reading here with the world they live in now. That's right. There you go. And you can't do that. Because you're not, you're not understanding what is going on if you do that. They didn't live in the 21st century. Totally different culture. So, chapter 21. So the plan was hatched. Jonathan was convinced. He saw what was going on. His dad's out of his mind. He sides with David. He helps David flee. Then came David to Nob, to Ahimelech. Oops, i got to stop. It's already 11. Okay, so we'll start chapter 21 next week. And you're going to see a spot here where David lies, and it's the wrong time to lie. It's the wrong time to lie, and it was wrong. He had no business doing that, and it's going to come at a dear cost. But you'll find that next week, or you can find it if you read ahead. <laughs> but you'll see what happens, and I'll explain why it's wrong, and what the difference is between when they were lying to Saul and when they're lying to this priest. Two different things. 
two different responses, or same response, but one was right and one was wrong. All right, let's pray. Uh, Silas, can you pray for us? Lord God, Father, we're thankful that we have the right to be harmless, uh, uh, wise as serpent, that harmless as doves, Lord. Um, we're just thankful that we can have a place to meet and that we do have the liberties and the freedoms to be here um, in your presence, Lord, as even if we didn't, we know that we'd get blessed for it. So just help us to have ears to, to hear and help us to comprehend and understand and put uh, your words in our lives. And Jesus name, amen. amen.